name is Harrison Austin Crater, Marine Corps. Uh, regular Marine Corps. There is a difference. Volunteer. Volunteer. Before the war, this was in peacetime, but mm -hmm. not long before. It was in October of 1941, and we were attacked in December the 7th, 41. Mm -hmm. What did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was within sight of uh, San Diego Bay, which is a segment, an arm of the, the Pacific Ocean. And when that was announced, I turned to the man next to me, whom I knew at the time, but I don't remember it now. I said, I guess you know where we're, where, what we're going to be doing now, don't you? He said, what? I said, we're going to be out on the ocean, and soon. And we were. I'd only been from Friday until Sunday since we just finished boot camp. What were you doing when you heard of the attack? We were playing softball out in Sandlot between barracks, the, the Marine barracks, and the Pacific Ocean, which is the norm of the Pacific. What did the military tell you you had to do? Get back to your back to where you're staying at the time. And of course they told us where we were staying. I, I can't remember that. It was just a barracks we were told to be in. Mm -hmm. And wait till you get further orders. This means war. We, it wasn't declared yet, you know. Yeah. But we all said this is war. You can't deny it. After we rechecked, had, had, had reassurance that it actually happened. It wasn't a joke. Okay. What were your missions when you were after war had been declared? We were out on the beach as guard duties with live ammunition with the, with, with the told to, if anybody tried to come up on the shore, they had to know the password and they had to mind what we said and mind us and get away from here. Don't shoot unless you have to, but if nothing else fails, shoot them. That's soon. You know, this is hours, a few hours, almost overnight. Okay. Did you stay in the U.S. the entire time, or did you have to go to any other countries? I spent almost three, well, I spent three years in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. How long did the war last? Only lasted about three years. Yeah. Well, there's where I spent it. Most of it. Um, how long were you actually like enlisted in the military? In the military? I went into combat on August the 7th, 1942. And was there four, four months to take an airport there that the Japanese had under construction. The Navy, it was a Navy operation all the way. General MacArthur had already been taken in the Philippines. He was in Australia, but we didn't report to him. This was a Navy operation completely. The highest men in the Navy were down there with what was left of our Navy. What was it like in Guadalcanal? Well, we had to go over the side of ships on cargo nets. That's what we used for ladders, over the side into smaller boats and take us ashore. And I got out and waded ashore. But we didn't go in. All of the infantry men went off over the side the same way and in, and not a shot was fired. We went there to take a, 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 a airstrip that was partially, almost, the Japanese had ready for small planes to land on, but our orders, when, before we went over the side of the ship, go here and take this place, shore up around it and protect it, and start developing it if you can, but stay there. Don't try to get out. You can't, you can't take this island in a hole. We want this airstrip. We want it, and we don't want the Japanese to get close to it. 
This is your life. It's their life or your life. Maybe we can get back and maybe we can't. We're, we're, only, we're only a part of our neighbor that we used to be. The rest of us, Pearl Harbor. But they'll get, they promised us they'd be back if they get back, but they left their fight in the Navy, the Japanese Navy. They, they, before they could get properly unloaded, they just put on the shore what they could do real quickly and raised anchor because the Japanese had found out we were there by that time. Okay. And we didn't have to fire a shot to take it. But everybody was loaded and locked. Everybody in the Marine Corps was armed in that day and age. 859592 is my rifle that I went in, the same one I had in boot camp. I still remember the number. Some things you don't forget. But we slept with them. We didn't move, we didn't do anything that we didn't have our rifles right with us, loaded and locked all of the way, no matter what we were doing. Okay, that was the third month after we owned Donald Canal. It was General Vandergrift. One, one day was different. I didn't know what it was, but late in the day, there was something different happening out. I, I heard sounds that I couldn't identify, and nobody else could tell me. But about dusk that day, it was in November of 1942, there was a seaplane flew over and we fired at him. He was fired upon. Then at dusk, there was a flare went off over the island there, over the airstrip. And that's when my boss took me out. He said, let's go. He took me to the general's staff place where he lived, his air raid shelter. He said, you sit here in this chair facing him. And pretty soon, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And I looked around. It had to be General Vandergrift. He was the only one there. That everybody else was gone. He said, will you come and help me? He didn't say, get off the uh, button, get in your old and that's all he said. And boy, I hopped up, hopped stuff off, turned around and watched to see where he's going. He went over and he had a little table there. He started picking up stuff out of a, a little shelf at the bottom and piling up on the table. It was papers. I followed him right over to where he picked up these, this whole stack of paper down on the, put it up top, top of the table and began ripping them apart and dropping them on the floor, ripping them apart. And I just walked up, stood opposite him. We didn't say a word to each other. But I looked him right in the eye and watched what he did, and I did the same thing. I started ripping up the same thing. Of course, I was a, I, I was a radio man. I saw that they were all marking, uh, you know, secret and all, those, uh, all of the proper marks on there that nobody's supposed to be looking at these things. But there I was looking at them, but he didn't say a word about it. I just kept ripping, I looked him right in the eye, he didn't say a word. We just kept it. Pretty soon he took his cigarette lighter and reached down there and set him a fire on a dirt floor. And that burnt, and we just kept ripping until we had them all ripped, a whole stack of them, and we had a pretty good sized fire. Never said one word. Now I said, this guy's going to tell me, you see, I didn't know the general that well. I wasn't his buddy. He's going to tell me to keep my big mouth shut and never breathe this to anybody because he sees what the th he knows who I am. He sees what we did to these papers. He knows what may happen to us. They're still firing at us from the ocean. The Japanese are out there. Our infantry boys are fighting them. I can hear that going on. He does. He thinks we're going to get taken over. But he's not saying it, not saying a word. He's not telling me to keep your mouth shut. No, when he was through, he said, thank you, that's all, and turned his back on me and walked away. And I thought to myself, now, he thinks I'll whip my head around to see where he's going, but I'm, he's, not gonna get, he's not gonna get that either. I'm not gonna do it. I don't know where he went, because I, <laughs> I was careful. I didn't even look around. <laughs> then, about that time, in came, in came another one of my associates from the, the, the firing from the ocean ceased a little bit, and I thought, boy, I'm glad, not, I'm glad they're through with that. Boy, did they ever give us a terrible shelling. Our maintenance 
our fuel dumps blew up, or our ammunition dumps blew up. They had just about put a script. The airplanes were all shot up down. We only had just a just a few fighter planes there. We had hardly anything to work with. And they had us down. And I said, the general's afraid we're going to have to abandon ship. We're in, we're in a bad way. So I went right up back. I'd never been my own air raid shelter. I stayed below my stump all the time. But we'd, we'd had one prepared down in, in, in the trees where the rest of my company was. And I went down there. I knew where that was. I went down and knocked on the door. And I said, is it full in there? They said, who are you? And I said, crater. What are you doing here? You don't belong down here. Get back on your stump. I said, no, I got to see you guys. I got a, I got a message for you. And I just walked in, and I, I began to take roll. I want to know who was in there that I knew. And Mac, I don't remember his last name, McKay, I think, from Florida, from uh, Texas. I remembered him, and he was standing there. Who's the, who's the, are you, Mac, are you the, uh, the, highest ranking non-com in here? He said, yes, I am. Okay, Mac, I'll stand next to you. About that time, a man from Message Center came in and handed him a message. He said, this is to be, this is to be sent to the clerk. It's sent on a piece of paper. We are being heavily shelled. Send that out in the clear. We, Obo to Obo 9 Obo, which means all stations, Everybody, O, O B O. That means everybody. Copy this message. We are being heavily shelled, and give our our call sign. Okay, Mac. I said, you're the you're the non-com to do. I'll hold it. I want to. I'll hold it for you. Then I said, you've got to get out there and crank up that gasoline engine on the transmitter. And I said, I know how hard that is. I'll be with you. We'll go out and crank her up. I told him that. He said, great. He said, I'm glad somebody out of this place in here would do that for me. <laughs>